Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our friends at MANIT for hosting today's session on treating patients with OCD and panic disorder in primary care with Dr. Smith. Dr. Judy Ann Smith is a general psychiatrist with a private practice in Madison, Wisconsin for 30 years, providing both psychotherapy and medications for patients. She has been a clinical adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinic since 1988. She teaches seminars to the residents and medical students on topics such as working with personality disorder patients, doing mental status exams, and diagnosing and treating difficult to treat psychiatric patients. Until 2008, she was the medical director for a mobile community outreach treatment program through the Mental Health Center of Dane County in Wisconsin, providing care for patients with severe schizophrenia. She has always loved teaching and over the years has supervised a variety of professionals in the community who are, who are providing care to patients with a mental health diagnosis. And now she volunteers for the Maven Project. Dr. Smith, when you are ready. All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning to some on some coasts and good afternoon to some others. Um, so I will proceed with my slides here and I have no disclosures to make. I have no fi financial investment in any of this that I'm saying today. Um, this is our team uh, listed here uh, with the MAVEN project and accreditation information. All right, so rather than read the goals to you, I'm just gonna tell you that I'm gonna try and go over uh, diagnosing panic disorder, diagnosing OCD, how to treat both of them with medications and others so you get a full feel for how we go about treating it and what you might be able to do in your clinic. I'm gonna do that from the perspective that I very much understand that you are often doing a mental health, providing mental health care because we have such, um, you know, we do not have enough psychiatrists at all right now and particularly the clients that you're seeing with the free clinics and whatnot um, um, often are the last ones to get in. So unfortunately, I know you're often carrying a great burden with trying to manage them yourselves. So I'll try and give you a little, some tips here and there on what you might be able to do. All right, so proceeding here. So the first thing um, we're gonna start with is panic attacks. And the first thing we want to do when you have someone in your clinic who has a panic attack or has had multiple panic attacks is you want to rule out medical causes. And my guess is you're pretty, you know, pretty efficient already with this, but I'll just summarize it pretty quickly, which is you want to rule out any intoxication with stimulants or withdrawal from uh, CNS depressants, since that can present with panic attack symptoms. Hyperthyroidism can also um, look like panic disorder. Hyperparathyroidism with an elevated calcium level can present in the same way. Theochromocytoma, also episodes of panic, but what's notable with that is they're gonna have headaches when they have these episodes. So I always question about headaches during the episodes of panic. And then certainly we can rule out that diagnosis and need for any work up there if we are able to check a blood pressure uh, during the, uh, a panic attack uh, with people with theochromocytoma. And if the blood pressure is normal, we can forget about that. Vestibular dysfunction, people can confuse with panic attacks. Um, but again, we want to ask about is there any you know, increased symptoms with positional, you know, position of the head, rolling over in bed and those kind of things. Seizure disorders, incontinence, loss of consciousness, the, uh, the typical things you ask to rule out seizure disorder. And then finally, cardiopulmonary diseases. Arrhythmias can sometimes look like panic attacks, your SVT, tachycardia, asthma, and COPD. And again, we look for the other symptoms that go with that. All right, so Medic, medical workup is usually pretty straightforward with someone with panic attacks, depending on their history, age, and additional symptoms. So we certainly want, as far as labs, calcium level and thyroid function tests to rule out 
um, what we talked about earlier with the labs, cardiac exam um, with additional tests as needed, EKG and or a Holter monitor if you're suspicious there may be an arrhythmia involved. So we've done all that. Let's say you've ruled out any kind of medical cause for the panic attacks. And now we're gonna distinguish a panic attack from general anxiety disorder. So a panic attack is not a diagnosis, as you know. It's a symptom cluster. It's like a fever, all right? Um, and basically it's an abrupt surge of intense fear that reaches a peak within five minutes, all right? usually within two to three. So it comes on, reaches a peak, and that's in contrast to general anxiety disorder where someone might wake up feeling anxious and over the next couple hours, that anxiety just gradually builds. All right. Panic attacks can occur at night and they can awaken the person. Okay. But these, let's sort out how that would present different. Do you ever have panic attacks at night? Yes. Tell me, what is it like? Um, do they awaken you from sleep? No, I'll wake up. Uh, okay, people with panic attacks at night with panic disorder, about a third of people with panic disorder will have panic attacks at night and they will awaken them from sleep and it'll be full, full, full fledged panic attack, all right? People with anxiety might wake up in the middle of the night and then start worrying and ruminating about it, and then their anxiety will rise, all right? So it should be pretty much full, full on if it's a panic attack as part of panic disorder in the middle of the night. All right, moving up. So panic disorder then is a disorder that has panic attacks. And these are episodes of repeated, spontaneous, out of the blue, releases of adrenaline, okay? I always tell patients, basically what panic disorder is, is all of us have a system where if we're out in the woods walking and a lion comes up, you want a system that makes your body ready to fight or flee, okay? And it, the body releases adrenaline so you can fight or flee. Well, panic disorder is a genetic disorder that is a spontaneous release of adrenaline when it's not needed, okay? All right, so we'll get into that for, so other things that can have panic attacks, PTSD, you can see panic attacks, and these occur when they're exposed to triggers. A helicopter going over overhead, if they're, they've been in Vietnam, et cetera, all right? Simple phobias, you can have panic attacks with exposure to the feared object or situation, flying in an airplane, spiders, being having a spider on them, they'll have a full-fledged panic attack, okay? Social phobia, you can see panic attacks and in reaction to interpersonal, you know, you know, oh my gosh, I've said something so stupid, everyone's gonna think I'm so stupid and have a full-fledged panic attack but it's set off by an interaction with someone that's upsetting. OCD can set off panic attacks. Oh my gosh, I've contaminated, I'm, uh, and I touched my daughter, I probably poisoned her, she's gonna die. Those kind of things can happen. All right. Uh, so how do we differentiate whether it's panic disorder from all these other possible causes of panic attacks? The first thing I wanna know is um, has the patient altered what they're doing, okay? Or what, uh, you know, what they're engaging in, where they're going based on the, the panic attacks. All right. So are they avoiding driving? Are they avoiding going to the store? Are they avoiding buses, crowds, places they can't escape from, okay? So let me give you an example of what I might ask. And we ask what, you know, I'll ask first what sets them off. They go, I don't know, I just have. Then I might say, what are you avoiding doing? And if they say, I, I'm not going to the store, I just, I just can't go to the store. Then I might say, what are you afraid will happen if you do go to the store? So a patient with social phobia will say that, oh, the last time I went to the checkout, the clerk thought I was a jerk. I got all messed up with what I said about how I was gonna pay 
I just was so humiliated, I can't stand it, okay? Social phobia. Patient with OCD might say, I'll touch something that's contaminated and they'll take it home. My kids are gonna get COVID and they're gonna die, okay? Patient with PTSD might say, then I'll, I've run into this man at the grocery store the last two times is in a combat uniform and it's horrible, I feel terrible reminds me of my rape experience, okay? They know exactly what set it off. Patient with panic disorder will almost always say that I'll have another episode of panic. It's all about the symptoms for them. They're afraid of having a panic attack, not the thing that precipitates it. So we talked about what is it? Abrupt onset, spontaneous release of adrenaline, reaches peak in a few minutes and initially comes out of the blue. I say initially because eventually they start, the patient tries to make sense out of why they had the panic attack. So they say grocery stores set them off or I, mean, I was driving the first time. So clearly driving sets them off. But when you hear it, it's most of them or at least half of them are spontaneous. And the first one almost always is or really is. Um, they will tend to have some, let's say when they're driving, if that's a fear for them, but also why they're watching a movie, just having a good time can come out of the blue. It can occur from a calm or an anxious space. If they start dreading because they had a panic attack there before, then you'll see it raising the anxiety when they go to that situation. And of course, they're a little more likely to have the panic attack then. The symptoms are characteristic, as you know, palpitation, increased heart rate, trembling, shortness of breath, et cetera. But the ones you almost always see are fear of going crazy or dying. They're almost sure they're gonna die, it's a heart attack or something, or they're gonna go crazy. All right, and just to meet criteria, it has to be followed by at least a month of anticipatory anxiety, fear of having another, okay? Or going crazy. Um, and then we also, as we said, want to look at the maladaptive behaviors that occur in their attempt. You know, human brains are always trying to solve problems. So they try to figure out how to, how to solve this. So they start avoiding things, driving, exercise. Oh, I had that one when I was out running. I'm not going to run outside anymore. I just not. That, that's what seems to set off. They start changing what they do. Okay. And of course, the extreme with panic disorders when they develop agoraphobia, which is their, they won't even leave the home. Okay. So the one, just some statistics, the one-year prevalence of panic disorder in the U.S. is 2 to 3% of adults and adolescents. And just so you can see, there's so many panic attacks that aren't part of panic disorder the one-year prevalence of uh, having a panic attack itself in the U.S. is 11.2% of the population, okay? Rare before age 14. And you'll see this is in contrast to OCD when we get there. The medium age of onset is in those early 20s, 20 to 24. And the female to male ratio is two to one. So more females than males develop it. With the genetics, it is a genetic disorder. 15% of relatives of patients with panic disorder also have this disorder. And smoking or and exposure to secondhand smoke both can set off panic attacks as well as uh, having asthma. So let's talk treatment. So we'll start with medication treatment of uh, panic disorder. Panic disorder is really quite responsive to um, medication treatment. Uh, often you can completely resolve the symptoms or they have minimal symptom panic attacks, which they're very much able to manage afterwards. So it's, this is a very treatable condition. We usually start with SSRIs and if that doesn't work, try an SNRI, okay? They're what we consider the first line of treatment. Um, you, this is the key thing with them though. You want to start with a very low dose of medication. You do not want to start with an SSRI like you would with the depression. Okay. 
there's something about panic disorder that exposure to an SSRI or SNRI at those neural, um, at the uh, junction, neural junction causes overstimulation when they're first presented with this medication. So that what will happen if you start them on, let's say 10 milligrams of um, escitalopram, as you might with depression, they will have a full fledged panic attack and just be jittery as all get out and then stop the medicine, not be willing to try it again. So you've got to start it very low and warn them, even when you start it low, they're probably going to feel more anxious initially. I tell them your, your neural, your neural um, um, places where your nerve, the synapse is hyper reactive right now with your panic disorder. And if we give this medicine to you, it could overstimulate initially. So we want to start really low. You may feel a little more anxious, but the good news is that will only last a week or two and that will go away and you will feel better and better. Okay. So start low, 25 milligrams sertraline would be as high as I'd start. 2.5 milligram escitalopram would be all I'd start with some of the panic disorder. And I tell them to call me. If it's too much, and we'll start even lower, okay? Um, so when we talked about it, uh, having them call you. All right, so tricyclic antidepressants also work, but not as well as SSRIs. MUI inhibitors also work, but they're complicated to use. In fact, they're very effective, but we usually don't get into them because of the special diet and all of that. Benzodiazepines are very effective um, with panic disorder, and we can use them either regularly scheduled or on a PRN basis. The problem with benzodiazepines is that they interfere with cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure treatment that we often also use in panic disorder. So if you put someone with panic disorder on a benzodiazepine, when you taper them off, they usually relapse immediately. Um, in contrast with an SSRI, if you combine with CBT, uh, cognitive behavior therapy and exposure, you can often taper them off that medication and then they do very fine. Okay. Um, but let's say we decide to use the benzodiazepines regularly scheduled, they can't tolerate SSRIs or whatever. Certainly that works very well. Um, you can also use them PRN. Um, for instance, lorazepam under the tongue, it bypasses, it's just small tablet under the tongue, it'll dissolve, bypass the liver and they get response in 10 minutes. I have many patients with panic disorder that have them so infrequently that they just carry a lorazepam tablet with them. And they tell me they often don't need to use it. They'll use their cognitive behavioral therapy, but they know it's there and it gives them, uh, helps them to feel brave and able to work through with the cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. So these medications do nothing for panic disorder. Bupropion, your Wellbutrin, Buspirone does nothing, Propranolol and beta blockers, which we use for performance anxiety, does nothing. So real quickly, we'll talk about treatment of panic disorder with exposure and cognitive behavioral therapy. And just because it's, it's a very quick thing you can kind of instruct them on, obviously more prolonged therapy, we'll have to wait till you get them in with someone, but there's just some basic premises that's important to tell them when you give them an SSRI medication. Um, so basic exposure pr pr principles. Often we talk about exposure, but we really don't explain how exposure works because if, someone is terrified they're going to have a panic attack at the grocery store and runs in really fast, grabs something and runs out, pays for it, runs out and gets out only when their anxiety is still really high. That will do nothing. That is not exposure therapy. Exposure therapy, exposure treatments must be prolonged long enough that the anxiety peaks and comes down at least 50% for the brain to be remodeled. Okay. And so I tell people if they're going to go to the store, if possible, 
have enough time, you can stay there till your anxiety comes down, okay? We'll be going into that more. But I warn them that with we don't want avoidance behavior because although it feels good, it actually, data is very clear, it increases the frequency and the severity of the panic attacks. All right, so cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's the cognitive part, the what do you do with your thoughts? And interestingly enough, with um, cognitive, with um, panic disorder, we all, you know, we think of, um, look at, think of something relaxing. Think of a, sitting by a beautiful stream. What's your most, that actually increases and worsens panic disorder. We do no relaxation training and we tell them not to do that. We actually teach them to do the opposite and you can do that quickly too. Um, people always tell them, just relax, just relax. It, it's worse. So what we want them to do is actually name what's happening. Oh, I'm having a panic attack. This is a spontaneous release of adrenaline or the hormone that, that helps me fight or flee. I have that genetic condition where my body acts as if there's a lion at my door when there isn't. Okay, I know what this is. Oh yeah, my heart's beating fast. Oh yeah, I know what that is. My heart's beating fast to get ready so I can fight or flee the lion. Okay, okay, I feel a little nauseous. Okay, that's because the blood's being diverted away from my stomach because, so I can fight or flee the lion. I get what's happening, okay? So we basically just teach them to focus on the symptoms. And if they do that, usually the symptoms will disappear in a few minutes, okay? Um, they don't get the secondary anxiety about the uh, release of adrenaline that goes on. Because breaking down of adrenaline takes about three to five minutes, okay? But it's the secondary anxiety that keeps it going. Now, the next thing we can do is teach uh, deep breathing techniques. Um, and I know you guys all know that. We do the three breaths, deep breaths with counting, you know, do whatever numbers you like. I do six, six in, six hold, and then exhale for a count of six, but any number you can use. But I do give them, I want them to get some power from that by explaining how it works, which is the diaphragm, the rubber band under the lungs that when it pulls down, expands the lungs and brings air in. But when you do that right under the diaphragm is a rich network of the parasympathetic ner nervous system, which I explain is the brake system for the nervous system. So that this helps to slow everything down sooner too. So I give it a little power by explaining that. And then the last thing I teach them is, which is very quick to do in the office, is also the love drug, uh, natural drug oxytocin. Um, which is what we get when we hold a baby to our chest, bare skin to bare skin, or when we pet our dogs or cats. And by the way, dogs and cats get a release of oxytocin also when we pet them. And that's why they look at, the, at you with those dreamy eyes. They're getting a, a rush from the oxytocin. So I teach them to take their wrist, bare wrist, and rub it against their bare chest. And that will also stimulate the release of oxytocin, okay? Now, we're gonna get into obsessive compulsive disorder, all right? So first, what are the obsessions? Those are the recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, images that are experienced as intrusive and unwanted, all right? They cause mark anxiety and distress. And here's the key about them and how you can separate them out from let's say gambling addiction, because that can be persistent recurrent thoughts or uh, eating disorder or um, drug and alcohol abuse, all right? These are never pleasant. They're unpleasant and troubling from the very beginning. With your gambling, with your drug and alcohol, there's a pleasure component. And eating, there's a pleasure component that at least initially, it may be eventually associated with a lot of negative feelings, but there's a, a pleasure component. This never is. All right, compulsions then are the repetitive behaviors or the mental acts 
that people do in reaction to the obsession. So hand washing with the fear of, um, oh my God, I'm uh, contaminated or checking, did I turn off that stove? I gotta go back, but, but what if I didn't remember? What if I didn't really check carefully enough? I gotta go back and check again. Well, maybe I look, but I didn't really see, okay? Repeat, uh, repeated behaviors, but they can also be internal things. Um, praying, counting in a certain pattern, repeating words silently, um, spelling backwards, all sorts of things that people feel compelled to do uh, or something bad is gonna happen if they don't. And the key is these are time consuming, more than one hour per day we're saying, or impairing. It makes it hard for them to get to work on time. I am someone who, I have an automatic door, garage door, opener and closer, and I back out of my driveway and many mornings I turn to leave and I go, did I close my garage door? So my neighbors, I'm sure, see me many times backing back in to look if I've closed my garage door. Luckily, I only have to do it once, three times a week, all right? So that's a little compulsion, but, and it's almost never, I don't know, it's been open the last year, you know, so it's, it's a little bit of a compulsion but it's not time consuming. I'm never late. Um, it doesn't monopolize my thoughts, all right? So OCD facts. This is a neuropsychiatric disorder. It causes terribly significant impairment, okay? Lifetime prevalence is one to 3% of the population. And 30% of patients with OCD also have a tick disorder part of the neuropsychiatric disorder, okay? By the way, um, males are more likely to have the tics than females are, okay? Mean onset of development is 19 and a half years of age, but 25% of them start before age 14. Remember we said um, the panic disorder almost never starts before age 14 but a quarter of these start before age 14. And if they start before age 14, they're usually really severe, okay? And by the way, males are more likely to start earlier in life, okay? Nonetheless, slightly more females than males, but it's very close, but slightly more females than males have OCD, but males are more likely to have the ticks. okay? Um, the course of this disease is a chronic, often waxing and waning, but it rarely goes away fully, okay? It's a long lifetime disorder. Um, and we talked about it's more severe if it starts before age 14. And if someone has it start um, in childhood, early age, the first degree relatives have a tenfold increased risk of the same disorder. So it's even more highly transmitted. And I want to talk, just draw your attention to of all the anxiety disorders, most of the anxiety disorders do not increase during pregnancy. If they have panic attack uh, disorders at other times, they may have panic disorders during the pregnancy, but it doesn't necessarily increase in incidence. OCD does. This is the one anxiety disorder most likely to increase or come on, have an onset during pregnancy. And the most common obsession is that the mother is afraid she will harm her baby. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, you want to make sure you find out about it if possible. Um, these mothers, when they do have these children, often will keep them in their bed and, and, and are afraid to carry them around for fear they'll throw their babies or do something to harm them. Um, and they're embarrassed and terrified to tell anyone. Um, so it's something we really want to be able to assess. Um, by the way, this should be very easy to sort out for postpartum psychosis where you, you know, hear about uh, women killing their children. In the case of postpartum psychosis, which by the way is almost always bipolar disorder in a psychotic episode, they have, they, when you question them about 
Um, they have voices telling them their baby, they believe their babies have been taken over by the devil or whatever. There's some reason they need to kill their babies. This is not the case with OCD. They're just afraid. But what if I did hurt them? Do you want to hurt them? Do you think they should be hurt? Oh, no. You know, it's, it's just a very different thing. They do not want to hurt their babies. They don't think their babies deserve it in any way. Okay. Now, OCD with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. So patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are at greatly increased risk for having OCD, okay? One out of four patients with schizophrenia will have OCD, 25%. And here's the thing that complicates it. Antipsychotics can sometimes increase or exacerbate, I mean, or sometimes cause or exacerbate OCD, okay? And it's complicated because uh, antipsychotics are used to treat OCD. Okay? So particularly clozapine, if you're familiar with that, I doubt you use it in your practice. It's a complicated antipsychotic to use. But clozapine and then olanzapine are the two antipsychotics most likely to cause or aggravate OCD. Okay? These the reason this is, is that both of these drugs have 5-HT2A antagonism effects, and we think that's what's involved in OCD, okay? So 10 per, to 15% of patients put on clozapine will develop new OCD. It is also dose-related. If patients are on less than 300 milligrams per day of clozapine, they usually don't have OCD symptoms with it but the higher the dose, the more likely to get it. Okay, um, so we're gonna get in, how do you treat OCD? OCD is the anxiety disorder least responsive to treatment with medication. This is a tough disorder to treat. Okay? SSRIs and SNRIs are first line treatment. I would start with an SSRI and then switch to an SNRI if the SSRI didn't work, um, just to try something different to see if it might. Um, you often need a higher dose than you do for depression. And it can take longer to work, up to 10 to 12 weeks or even longer. But when you see that, do know that that doesn't mean that we don't tend to see any response until we get to 10 to 12 weeks we usually expect to start to see a response around, you know, three to four weeks. And if we don't, you know, I'm a little worried, or is this person going to get a response? But we keep getting people, you know, getting better responses and adding on. So we keep going up to 12 weeks minimal to make sure it's not a, I mean, to make sure we get a full trial with that medication. Okay. And as we talked, we would push the dose up to the higher range uh, to try and get as good a response as we can. Okay. And here's the sad news. Even when they do respond, only 40 to 60 percent, well, first of all, only 46, 40 to 60 percent of patients respond to treatment at all of this treatment. So it's pretty grim. You're leaving 50 percent out. And if they have a response, they only get about a 40 to 50% decrease in the symptoms. So it's not a great response, okay? So let's say you get, you try an SSRI or SMRI and you only get a partial response. What next? You can add a low dose of clomipramine, 50 to 75 milligrams per day. We'd start at 25 and you increase it to 50 or 75 milligrams per day. If you do use clomipramine, we usually get an uh, EKG. Uh, if they have any cardiac history or they're an older patient, check for drug interactions between your SSRI and S or SNRI and clomipramine because some of them do have a drug interaction affecting the blood level of each other's and you adjust the dose accordingly. Okay. If you don't get any response to the SSRI and then an SNRI, you just get nothing. 
then I would stop or switch over to clomipramine. Okay. Clomipramine is the only tricyclic that works for OCD. It has serotonin effects. You got it to, in order to work for um, OCD with this. Okay. Um, so it's the only tricyclic that has serotonin effects. Um, and studies show it's slightly more effective than the SSRIs and SNRIs, okay? But they're less well, it, it's less well tolerated, so we usually start with the others. The typical SSRI side effects are what you see, sedation, dry mouth, constipation, weight gain, urinary hesitancy, and all of that. Some people tolerate it very well, and they're so pleased with the response. It does tend to have a better response, a little bit better. You start 25 milligrams at bedtime, then increase by 25 milligrams a day, every day for five to seven days until you get up to a target dose or good enough response the patient's pleased with it, yet the side, you know, they're starting to get some side effects that bother them, bother them or a target dose of 150 to 250 milligrams per day. All right, let's say that doesn't work or whatever. You've got them on clomipramine or you've got them on an SSRI and they're just not getting the response you want. And you're still waiting for the psychiatrist. What can you do? Okay. And it's still months out before you can get them in with a psychiatrist. All right. So antipsychotics are the first line after clomipramine that we look at trying. And I know that seems strange because we talked about it can aggravate OCD. So we'll get into that in a second. But one out of three patients with OCD will respond when you add an antipsychotic onto an SSRI or clomipramine. Okay. That does mean two out of three will not. But nonetheless, when they do, it can be quite impressive. Avoid a lanspine. Remember we talked about a lanspine and clozapine are the two most likely to cause psychosis. So you want to avoid lanspine. Don't use that one because it increases that 5-HT2A antagonism. Risperidone and haloperidol have the most solid evidence, but haloperidol is not well tolerated. So we often will start with risperidone at one. I'd start with one milligram a day and then increase to two milligrams if that doesn't work after a couple of weeks. Um, but there's also growing evidence and really pretty good evidence now that aripiprazole, which is better tolerated than risperidone, um, aripiprazole is also very effective. With that, I'd start at two milligrams and then slowly increase it if needed up to 15 milligrams a day. Okay. Um, and then there's some small trials with quetiapine that show that it may be effective too but I would go with either aripiprazole or risperidone first. And again, keep the dose low. Okay, so let's say it's six months. You still can't get the patient in and you don't know when you're gonna get them in with the psychiatrist. What are some other options? And I know most of these you would not be comfortable using, but I'm gonna just draw your attention to what is often used, tried with augmentation. And the one that you might be really comfortable using would be amantadine because um, you use it in other conditions. And amantadine, 100 milligrams per day, does have some data that suggests it can be helpful. So it's useful to give that a try for four weeks, see if that makes um, any difference. It's well-tolerated medicine, as you know. Um, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, just stop it. Lamotrigine gene, I know you also work with in other settings, um, but the recent data with it has not been looking really very impressive. So um, you could consider it, um, or if you've got someone with bipolar disorder, well, that might make sense. Give it a try, all right? And the others are more, you know, mixed data and um, being a small studies. All right. Medications that clearly don't help OCD. Wellbutrin, bupropion, buspirone, not at all. Benzodiazepines are terrible. They do nothing for OCD and they also interfere with the behavioral therapies which we'll be talking about, okay? And then the, another just side note is if any of you use mertazapine, your, your Remeron is its brand name, 
mirtazapine is an antidepressant that also increases 5-HT2A antagonism. And so it can make OCD worse. So you don't want to use that with it. And if they're on that for depression and they're getting OCD symptom, I would switch them to another antidepressant. Um, and then again, tricyclic antidepressants other than clomipramine. I hope I didn't go. Okay, I did go too, too far. Okay, so now we're going to talk about OCD with exposure and response pre uh, prevention. And I'm telling you this so you know what it is. I don't expect you to do it or anything like that. But if you're looking for someone to treat your patient, Google that if it's a patient with OCD. Could I? Because I can tell you, uh, interpersonal therapy doesn't work with uh, with OCD. Uh, cognitive, be I mean, excuse me. Um, a supportive therapy doesn't work. Um, psychodynamic therapy doesn't work. You must have expo exposure with response prevention to be effective with OCD. Might be helpful for other parts of their their lives. These other therapies definitely with other parts, but not with OCD. Okay, and I want you to know. You know, and, and, you, and if you enter that into the computer and Google it, you can find therapists or treat uh, programs that work with that. All right. Most effective treatment for OCD by far. FOA has done much work with OCD. Uh, in one of her studies, found that using clomipramine, which remember we talked about is the most effective of the medications we have for um, OCD only 42% of patients responded to clomipramine, okay? 62% of patients responded to exposure with response prevention by itself without any medication, okay? And if you use the combination, 70% of patients get a very, you know, quite a good response, okay? And the neat part is it has lasting effects where medication, if you go off, that's it. This has lasting effects through their life. All right, so I'm gonna talk real quickly about what it is so you know what it is and can re you know support your patient in this. So again, that exposure, prolonged exposure to the feared object, thought, or behavior. Short exposures won't work. Um, run in the store, back out, won't work, okay? With exposure, the anxiety has to peak, come down, peak, come down to at least 50%. And then you're getting rewiring of the brain. Let's talk quickly of why that's there. First of all, all of us are wired to have fears very easily, okay? Reason why, we're group animals. If a monkey, group of monkeys goes up, one picks up a snake, gets bitten, dies, you don't want all the monkeys picking up a snake and dying, all right? So we... We see things in the news, we see things around us, and we get fearful very easily to preserve our species, all right? However, we also re rewire easily. So the reason why, if a bunch of monkeys go to a, a pond and one is drinking, gets caught by a crocodile and gets eaten, all the monkeys go leave and don't come back to that pond, they go to a different one to drink, um, but that pond dries up, all right? And eventually they got to go back to the pond where the, the monkey was eaten by the crocodile. Well, the crocodiles died or gone to another pond and they resume drinking fearfully, but eventually are very calm and get their water they need. So we are made to be able to master things and our brains are, it's built into our brains. And I'll take, tell you another example, it's not just primate and high level animals that are built this way. Our fear, the fear part of our brain is a very primitive part of our brain. It's beneath the big cortex, that big thinking part that goes over our head. The fear area is deep in the limbic system, and this is primitive. So we can take snails, and they've got their heads out, and I'm going to take a syringe with cold water in it, and I'm going to spray that snail, and it'll pull its head in its shell. If I keep doing this, wait till its head comes out, then spray it, it pulls its head in, and I keep doing this, eventually the snail will quit pulling its head in. 
Now I'm going to spray that head 10 more times and the snail won't pull it in. Then I'm going to put the snail in a box, bring it out a week later. Snail has its head out. I'm going to spray it and it's going to pull its head back in. However, if I tape a group of snails and I do the same thing again and I spray until they quit pulling their heads in, and then instead of just spraying 10 times after they stop pulling their heads in, I spray a hundred times and they keep their head out for a hundred sprays. Then I put them in a box for a week. I bring those snails out. I spray them with cold water. They won't pull their heads in. They have remodeled their neural system of fears. Okay. That's what we do with exposure therapy. Now I'll tell you one more antidote, which is my B, my own experience. I had a phobia, simple phobia of bees, and I had exposure to bees all the time. I'd go to picnics, there were bees on the table, but I would lean back and maybe get up. There was one on my, you know, on a pop, I'd move to another, another picnic table. So I was doing avoidance behavior, kind of adjusting my seat, scooting down, whatever it is. So my brain was learning, phew, we escaped just in the nick of time. Then I went with my husband to Colorado and we want, I wanted to go on this long hike, three to four hour hike to the, the summit where we could see 360 degrees around. It's supposed to be beautiful. So we get out of the car, start hiking, and there's wildflowers on either side of our trail. And I began gripping my husband's arm going, oh my gosh, there's so many bees. They're flying back and forth and back and forth. And he goes, do you want to go back? And I go, no, I want to make it to the summit. So we keep walking. And after about two hours talking about various things, and I say to him, thank goodness those bees cleared out. I'm so glad they did. And he looks around, he goes, bees haven't cleared out. There's just as many bees. And it really felt like the bees were gone to me. And I looked, wildflowers everywhere, bees everywhere. So we walked to the top enjoyed our view, came back down, and I have not been afraid of bees since, all right? So that's exposure therapy. It's extremely effective. Dr. Smith, I just wanted to jump in. We have about 12 minutes left, so I just want to make sure we have a Q&A section. Okay, I'll finish up really quickly. Let's see. I did get. Okay, so I'll just say cognitive behavioral real, real quickly, and you can teach your patient this in your office real quickly. We talk about ex exposure, but let's say just teach them that it's an uh, OCD is obsessions cost, caught in a loop, and they feel very scary because it keeps looping, so it makes them feel it's real, okay? And that what we want them to do is just watch the loops. Oh, yeah, and name it. That's that's OCD, there it goes, it's looping. And you can also tell them to sing a song about them. Oh, I'm afraid of, you know, whatever it is. And that um, stimulates a part of the brain that cuts off the obsession. And we won't get into engaging with family members with it. Um, alternatives, as you can see, we have some um, psychosurgery in cases um, and it's very effective, 51% of treatment to completely resistant patients, but it is high risk. Deep brain stimulation, yes. And now there's a uh, transcranial uh, stimulation, the magnetic, and that just got FDA approval. So you can also refer them for that, but it's still being, it's still early. So the summary, I think I'll stop there. So we have time for answers, but um, all right. All right. All right, well, we don't have any questions yet. Uh, so we can kind of talk if you'd like to, but remember, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box or the chat feature. I'll read them to Dr. Smith, or if you'd like to talk with Dr. Smith directly, just use the raise hand feature. So while we, uh, while we wait, do you want to go through your summary? Sure, and just interrupt me at any time, okay? Okay. So in summary, when you encounter a patient with panic attacks, first you want to rule out medical causes, and you knew that. You want to find out which psychiatric cause, I mean, which psychiatric disorder is causing the panic attacks since this will affect treatment. Panic disorder responds very well to medications, but you must start much lower than if you're treating it depression. And panic disorder also responds well to benzodiazepines, but they can interfere with the 
cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure therapy. OCD is very difficult to treat with medications, not easy. SSRIs, and if that doesn't work, SNRI. If that doesn't work, then try and clomipramine. All of them may help, but they do have a high failure rate and a partial response at best. Antipsychotics in low dose can augment a response. However, avoid clospine or lanspine with it if possible. And sometimes higher doses of other antipsychotics can make OCD worse. Benzodiazepines do not help OCD and will interfere with the best treatment for OCD and um, exposure response prevention and cognitive behavioral therapy are best treatments by far. Okay, that's it. All right. Well, we're still waiting for questions, so maybe I uh, jumped in oh. a little too soon. <laughs> I hope I didn't put them all to sleep. I, I paid attention. I thought it was great. So I thought it was, uh, I thought you did wonderful. Oh, here we go. Can you speak to safer pharmacological agents in the geriatric population to treat anxiety and insomnia? Um, general anxiety and insomnia. Is that what they're saying? I think so. It says just to treat anxiety, insomnia with the, the old, yes, yes, she answered, <laughs> generalized. Okay, so that's a whole nother, I'm gonna real quickly get something out. Um, hang on one second. But um, SSRIs are of course our first line treatment for anxiety in seniors also. Um, and, um, yeah, let me get to what I want to do. Um, and there's something I want to tell you that's kind of a cool thing. Um, it's another talk I have. Um, obviously, you've got to watch for hyponatremia with seniors. That's the real big risk we get in with the SSRIs. Um, but they can certainly be helpful with that. And they don't do a lot for insomnia, which is unfortunate. Um, and we hate to use benzodiazepines with them. Um, what I'm going to give you is kind of just something that's some new data I can get to. Uh, a med, I'm gonna, it's an herbal agent and I'm not an herbal agent user, so you need to know that. But something to consider using with senior is um, called Selexan. I'm gonna spell it S-I-L-E-X-A-N, okay? And it's only good for general anxiety disorder, doesn't work for panic disorder. It doesn't work for OCD or anything like that. It is actually lavender, a branded, um, branded extract of lavender. And in Europe, they use it all over and it's a prescription med in Europe. But here we do things as herbals. Um, so it's, yeah, it's one of the main treatments they use in Europe. Um, in 14 countries, okay, for, for general anxiety disorder. Um, I would get the brand, I've got Calm Aid through Schwabi's Nature Way line, and I can write that up for you or whatever, or send that to you if you ask. Um, but it's Nature's Way line, it's a safe, it's, it's been checked to see that there's no contaminants in it, and 80 milligrams to 160 milligrams a day, and they don't tend to have any you know, much of any side effects other than some um, burping sometimes, a gas, and that's about it, which is really nice. It takes two to five weeks to take effect. So that's just something I'd like to pass along that I've had success with with patients, especially seniors who just cannot because of hyponatremia with some of those SSRIs. Insomnia is a whole other thing that I think is too long for this time. I'm sorry, it's complicated. We do have a few more questions. So this one okay. says, I saw a teen this week with hyper, hyper, hyperhidrosis worsened by what sounds like anxiety triggered by stressful social interactions at school. Sweating hands are stimulated and worsen his anxiety. I decided to try a beta blocker and dry salt with a BH referral. Do you recommend CBT over DBT? Um. Okay, so this person has social phobias, I'm hearing, or what is, okay, so okay. it's afraid with, could you read the first part of the question? I didn't quite hear. So I saw a teen this week with hype, 
hyperhidrosis worsened by what sounds like anxiety triggered by stressful social interactions at school. Okay, so this is social phobia. With that, I would really look at an SSRI. Um, I, beta blockers are good for intermittent type of um, anxiety, like public speaking anxiety, um, performance, a musician who has a performance, but not as good for ongoing anxiety. Um, plus they make often make exercise and doing activities more difficult. Um, so I would look at an SSRI. They are very effective with social anxiety disorder. I have one patient with OCD taking venalaxine, ER. Then uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, 225 milligrams QD and sees a therapist. If I can find ERP therapy for her, how long before she sees improvement? Hmm. Um, it, it's all dependent on how willing they are to do the, you know, what they, you know, do the exercises and stuff. Um, ideally, a it's a kind of therapist that might meet with the patient, take them out and do them or go to their home and do it. It's really nice. I mean, it's incredibly impressive. And if they start with that, they can see a response easily within three weeks. Okay. But some people are too fearful to start very fast and they go real slow. It's all up to the patient how fast they want to go. Mine with my B thing was mostly you don't get... Um, you know, response in one day, but I did an eight hour hike. I did an eight hour exposure. So it's how long you're going to do the exposure. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry. Can you please hold on one? I'm sorry. sorry. Can you please repeat the brand company used for Silexin? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll spell, spell it. Um, calm, C-A-L-M. AID, A-I-D, it's one word, and it's through Schwabies, S-C-H-W-A-B-E, apostrophe S, and then it's Nature's Way line of herbals, okay? And it's 80 milligrams, start with that, but if that doesn't do the trick, you can go up to 160 milligrams takes two to five weeks to work. Uh, wonderful, thank you. Yes. All right, so I don't see any more questions and we are at the, the hour mark. So thank you, Dr. Smith, so much. Oh, you bet. Okay, wonderful. thank you everybody for doing all the psychiatry you do in your clinics with patients. I so, my heart goes out to you. Thank you. All right, thank you and take care.